afternoon, and welcome back to AIADA's Auto Talk. I hope you all had a great summer. I'm your host, Rachel Soleimani. Before we get started, a few quick reminders for our new listeners. Anyone that is registered for today's program will be receiving a copy by early next week. And if you have any questions, feel free to enter them into the Q&A bar in the lower right-hand side of your interface. Now, please join me in welcoming Cox Automotive Senior Economist, Charlie Chesbro. Charlie, I feel like I say this every quarter when you come on, but a lot has happened since you last spoke to us in June. So I'm just going to let you take it away. All right. Well, well, thank you, Rachel. And yeah, a lot has been going on. And I'll apologize up front because we're going to cover a lot of ground today and a lot of information. But I just wanted to make sure you guys uh, were updated on some of the key topics out there. I'm going to give you a quick update on what we're seeing with the economy and what it might mean for the vehicle market. Uh, I then want to give you a quick update on the new vehicle market and where sales are at and really discuss this new lean and mean strategy, which appears to be uh, the go-to, I think, at this point for the industry uh, for now. Uh, and then give you a quick update on what's happening with the used market, because we are seeing the prices are starting to show a little bit of weakness. Uh, so something to be aware of, uh, but not be too concerned about just yet. Uh, and lastly, I did want to talk about EV adoption. We just got the uh, Inflation Reduction Act passed. I'm going to talk a bit about that and, and talk about how uh, EVs are really starting to take off. And that's one of the new things that's happening in the post-COVID market. So let's start about the good news out there, which is the unemployment rate. Uh, this is a chart that's showing the unemployment rate from the Bureau of Labor Statistics going back to 1950. Uh, and I've circled where we are today. Uh, we are currently at 3.7%. And the good news from that is it actually ticked up a tenth of a percent uh, in uh, August. Uh, so that's uh, normally not good news, but it's good news if, you're, if you don't want to see the Fed have to raise interest rates aggressively. And that's really what we're watching for at this point. The Federal Reserve is concerned that we uh, have too hot an economy. And one of the things that uh, is a result of that is the unemployment rate is really, really low. And when it's this low, it's putting upward pressure on wages. The Fed's going to want to push this unemployment rate higher here over the course of 2023. So we did get our first data point uh, in the post-Fed uh, policy change uh, movement that was ticking up. Uh, so that's one of the good signs out there. But it still remains historically low, and job creation is still running quite strong. Uh, we've been running about a half million jobs a month uh, for all of this year, but it was a little bit less last month. So the question is, is, is it slowing? And the concern out there, as I mentioned, is inflation. And this is a chart that's showing uh, the consumer price index. Uh, that, too, had a little bit of a downtick in our most recent data point uh, from July. Uh, inflation actually fell back from the rate that we had in uh, June. Again, sort of a positive indication that maybe some of this inflation is cyclical, that it is going to start to tick lower. We've already seen that gas prices have made a substantial uh, decline. Uh, we were, I think, peaked at about $5.02 in early June. Uh, gas prices have now fallen back to about $3.70 nationally. So that's certainly uh, providing some relief out there to consumers. And we'll see that in our consumer sentiment numbers. That's where it's getting picked up right now. But that will have other ramifications for inflation. But the Fed is concerned. Is inflation too hot? They have to slow it down. And so they're going to be raising interest rates in order to, to slow about this inflation. And everyone's been asking, are we going to see a recession? This is going to lead to recession. Well, we've already had uh, two quarters of negative economic growth, which technically in your old economics uh, textbook was a recession. But it's a little bit of an odd time that we've had because we had really, really strong economic growth in the fourth quarter, and we had negative economic growth in Q1 and in Q2 of this year. But consumer spending still remained quite strong. And normally when you have a real recession, uh, consumers are what's pulled back from the market. So far, what we've had is uh, it's been a bit of an anomaly because of adjustments made to inventories, uh, as well as import exports uh, being uh, changing. And that sort of led to this negative growth rate that we have. Um, but technically, I wouldn't say that we're really in a recession just yet. It's nothing that really has impacted consumers. And that's what has to happen uh, in order to get to where the Fed wants, which is a, a little bit of a less strong economy. This is a chart that's showing the uh, interest rate of the 10-year Treasury minus the two-year Treasury. It used to be called the TED spread. But this is what uh, Wall Street generally looks at when they want to gauge, do we have to worry about a recession? And what's happened here, I've highlighted in red, is that the near-term rates have gone higher than the longer-term rates. Uh, that means that the, in the economy, that investors are more worried, are, are going to demand a higher interest rate to lend you money over the short term than the long term. 
That's an environment that banks can't make money in. They can't uh, uh, lend uh, lend long and, and try to make money short uh, in that environment, um, and 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 vice versa. So it's very the vol the volatility of these interest rates makes it very difficult. And banks pull back on lending. And so, in, historically, any time that the interest rates have inverted, uh, we've been followed by a recession in the U.S. economy. And I'm showing you a chart here that's showing about 45 years worth of data. Every time that this inversion has gone below, below that red line, the economy has slipped into a recession just a few months afterward. You can see where we are today, and that's why folks are so concerned. The other thing we're looking out out there is consumer sentiment. Uh, this is from the University of Michigan. They talked to thousands of consumers out there. And we got a data point in June, which was an all-time low for this measure, going back to 1978. Uh, you know, pretty remarkable when you think about uh, all that we've gone through over the last, uh, you know, 45 years or so. And we hit this low because everyone was so concerned about uh, uh, the political environment that we're in, the, the economy, the rising interest rates, and of course, inflation. And that was during a period when gas was hitting $5 a gallon. We've slowly bounced off of that a little bit. And you can see here, I've highlighted in red that we hit that bottom, but we've now come back a little bit. And that up increase that we had uh, in the most recent data points is all from gas prices falling lower. So people out there are still quite concerned, uh, but the situation has improved uh, just slightly. But this is going to weigh on consumers' demand for any vehicles out there, but certainly new vehicles. Uh, you're going to need to be confident uh, and feel pretty secure about your own situation as well as the overall economy. If you're going to take out a, you know, a thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar auto loan to buy a new vehicle, uh, and so this is all kind of suppressing that overall outlook in the economy, and it's certainly going to have an imp implications for the vehicle market. As I've shown you guys before, the other thing I like to look at is the political sentiment uh, out there, and I find this to kind of be the most useful measure. Uh, and it looks at that earlier, earlier line I just showed you of looking at overall consumer confidence, and it looks at the breakdown by political affiliation. And really the key point here is that we can see that prior to uh, uh, COVID hitting the economy, this is back going back to February of 2020 on the far left here, we can see that Republican sentiment out there was 47 points higher than, than Democrats. Then we had the election and now we've had COVID and everything else. And you can see where we are today on the far right, that now we have Republicans 34 percent, uh, thir excuse me, 34 points lower than where Democrats are. So they view the economy in a much uh, more precarious situation than even Democrats. But I will say, if there's one thing we can say about President Biden, uh, on the far left, we can see that everybody is below 100, which is sort of the neutral outlook. So everybody's pretty pessimistic out there. So I will say that at least Americans are united on this topic, that everybody agrees uh, things are looking pretty, pretty uh, tough out there right now. But I will say uh, we haven't really seen much of that uh, spill over into the automotive market just yet, but we are starting to see some early signals out there that you should be aware of. And one of them that I'm looking at here is delinquency rates. Uh, this is folks that are uh, 60 plus days or more uh, delinquent on their auto loans. And we've got two lines here. One is uh, all people. And then in red is the percent of folks that are uh, delinquent that are subprime borrowers. And the key takeaways here, I think, are uh, one is that uh, uh, delinquency rates in general uh, still look fairly uh, normal. They haven't uh, taken off in this environment. But as you can see on the far right, we are starting to see that subprime delinquency rates are starting to rise. And in fact, it hit record levels. So on the outskirts of the, of the vehicle market, the folks that are subprime borrowers out there, they are starting to feel some of the heat. And so uh, delinquency rates are starting to tick up a little bit kind of the first indication that we're seeing out there. The other thing that we have to watch for is, uh, will these rise in interest rates and the, and the slowing economy uh, have implications for whether banks will want to lend to the automotive industry? And that's gonna be an important factor is, uh, is credit being made available, are loans being made available uh, to auto uh, borrowers out there? And so far what we can see is yes, they are still making credit available that lending remains strong. Uh, on the far left, uh, or excuse me, on the far right here, this is showing by different credit scores what the total amount of uh, of lending was done each quarter by the Federal Reserve Bank captures this. And this is in billions of dollars. And the key takeaway here is, is that in the, uh, uh, in the second quarter, the lending to automotive uh, was actually down just a little bit on a year-over-year -year basis, but it was up 13% from where it was in the first quarter. 
So it still remains quite strong. The other key takeaway here is the red line. That is the percent of the, uh, the loans out there that are being made to subprime. And this is where I think it's an important uh, aspect of the market that we have today. Uh, you can see that the subprime share remains historically relatively low. Uh, you can see on the, on the right, or excuse me, on the left here, uh, when that red line went quite high, that was during the 2007, 2008 financial crisis. And uh, we had a lot of lending being done, to uh, done for subprime borrowers. We're not in that situation today. They have already left the market. Uh, there isn't a lot of lending there. So these higher interest rates are starting to have an impact on subprime borrowers, but they're not as large a portion of the new vehicle market. So it's not as, as concerning as it might be otherwise. And that's one of the interesting things that we're seeing out there in the new vehicle market. The composition of who is buying vehicles has changed uh, dramatically, at least new vehicles. And this is a chart that helps uh, help us look, look at that. This is from our dealer track uh, point of sale data where we, we capture uh, information on uh, transaction prices and uh, uh, interest rate, uh, down payment, all of that uh, information. And we're able to measure what is the average uh, interest rate that folks have been uh, signing up for when they buy a vehicle. And we can see that in 2019 and early 2020, the average interest rate was around 6%. But then COVID hit in, uh, in March of 2020, and the average interest rate fell dramatically. Now, part of this was a little bit of subvention done by some of the manufacturers, a little bit more rate cutting. But the vast majority of this move was the fact that people who were of higher, uh, uh, or excuse me, of, of lower credit worthiness, uh, had lower FICO scores, people who would pay a higher interest rate left the new vehicle market. So all that remained were people of higher credit quality, higher incomes. And as a result, they qualify for a better interest rate. So we saw the actual uh, contract interest rate of the new vehicle market fall to around four and a half percent and remained at this level all through the COVID crisis. And that's really reflecting that we have a very sound uh, strong credit quality, high income buyer in the new vehicle market today. But now you can see in the most recent data months uh, that the average, in average interest rate is starting to increase. This is not because we're starting to get more uh, lower income, uh, uh, lower FICO score people into the new vehicle market. It's that the interest rate that people are being offered is now starting to rise, that there is no escape from these higher interest rates. And so that's uh, leading that the whole market is now uh, looking at higher rates. And so this is going to have an impact on monthly payments, uh, you know, somewhere in the ballpark of $50 a month uh, if if, uh, if uh, interest rates go higher. And at this point, uh, the Fed uh, has already had two uh, interest rate increases uh, uh, this year in June and July. They're expected to do another three-quarter point interest rate increase uh, later this month in September. And there's expected to be another uh, either half point or more uh, in November uh, and December. So there are more rates coming this year. The question is, is what happens in 2023? There's a lot of talk on Wall Street that they've gone too fast, that they're going to raise them too much, that they're going to have to start cutting next year. Uh, there's a lot of scuttlebutt about that, but that's kind of where we're at. But in terms of where the, the impact is right now, it is starting to hit uh, the new vehicle market and what people are paying for. The other interesting thing, though, is it's changing the competition in the new vehicle market. This is a chart that's looking at the average interest rate that uh, the different buyers of these brands uh, is paying. And it reveals something about the customer bases that these brands have uh, and the changing marketplace. And, and I guess the key takeaways here are, you can see in light green and, and in uh, light blue that Subaru and Honda, their customers uh, are paying the best interest rates uh, in the market. Uh, they're paying somewhere, you know, prior to COVID, they were paying more around a three or 4% rate uh, it fell, but now it's rising dramatically, such that now uh, that Subaru and Honda uh, customers are paying uh, a higher rate uh, than they were just a few months ago. But we also can see uh, Nissan in dark red. Their customers were paying about an 8% uh, uh, APR before uh, COVID hit, and it fell during the crisis. That their, The average Nissan buyer had a better credit quality, uh, and it fell, but now it too is starting to rise. And what's interesting here is that you can see there was quite a bit of variability prior to COVID, a lot of range between these different brands in terms of what their customers were paying for an average interest rate. But as you can see on the far right, it's much more consolidated now. Uh, the, the, the interest rates, there's very little difference between these, these uh, brands now. Essentially, everybody is competing for the same customer out there, the same income, the same credit quality buyers out there, and everybody's uh, fighting for that same person. So. 
that's why the market that we have today is really quite different, that we just don't see we're in a situation that if we do hit a recession, that the new vehicle market is going to fall off of a cliff. Uh, we expect that we're just not in the situation that we were back in, in 2007, 2008. And as you can see on this chart, I've got on the left, these are the vehicle sales that we had during the Great Recession. And that we can see in 2007, we were doing about a 16 million new vehicle market. But then the crisis hit in 2008 and 9, and we fell to you know almost half of that before making the nice recovery. As we can see on the right, though, we're in a different situation today. The market's already fallen dramatically from the 17 million levels that we were at back in 2019. We're expecting a market of about 13.7 million this year. If a recession hits and really has an impact on the economy, we just don't see that it's going to have the same implications as it had before because we've already lost those subprime borrowers, uh, you know, the higher income buyer buyers are what's remains in the market, and they're just not as vulnerable uh, to this recession if and, if and when it does come. So let's talk about where we are today in the new vehicle market. Uh, looking at the light vehicle sales, SAR, uh, really not a lot of change here. We just had the month of August. We had a 13.2 million pace uh, that was down from uh, where we were just in July, but pretty much on a flat level. And that's really where we're at. Vehicle sales are essentially stuck at or around a 1.1 million pace each month for about 12 months straight now. Uh, there really has just not been much change. And the expectation was, is we were gonna see a, an influx of new inventory in the second half of this year. Uh, that a lot of pent up demand was gonna be able to be fulfilled, but these higher interest rates and these ongoing COVID and other supply chain disruptions in Asia, uh, and of course the Ukraine war, uh, all of it is, is really being a major headwind. We just don't see the comeback happening this year like we had thought at the start of the year. And we now expect the market to finish at around 13.7 million. Uh, currently we're down about 15% uh, year to date. And uh, it's really hard to see that the, the industry is gonna make any substantial change here over the next couple months. But we are starting to see some little kernels of, of uh, optimism there, uh, at least in terms of supply. This is a chart looking at the new vehicle supply. This comes from our V Auto data. And this is a summary of what's on dealer lots across the country. And that red line is what we're doing here in 2022. And you can see we've fallen dramatically from the inventories we had in previous years, but we're actually above the inventory levels that we had at this point last year. We were in sort of the tightest, uh, uh, most lean environment at this point a year ago. Uh, and so we do have a little bit in more inventory than we did then. Uh, but these higher prices are making a little bit more of a challenge uh, for buyers out there. Uh, but as you can see, that red line, it is starting to tick up a little bit. And those are the signals that uh, uh, inventory has been creeping higher through the course of this year, but it did start to make a little bit more aggressive move the last couple of weeks. So we're keeping our fingers crossed. On the right, we can see days of supply or how long this inventory will last based on our current sales rates. And you can see that too is above the levels we were at last year when we were at peak a constraint, uh, but it's essentially flatlined. The market is not gonna make any substantial move here uh, until conditions change uh, substantially on the ground. Uh, just to give you a quick update on what's going on with the different brands, uh, this really hasn't changed much over the summer. Uh, we still, there's quite a variability out there that not all brands are in the same boat re regarding their, uh, uh, their level of, of uh, available inventory, but clearly the Asian brands, Kia, Toyota, Hyundai, uh, Subaru, uh, uh, Honda, you know, they all have incredibly tight inventories right now, uh, well below what the national average is of around 40 days. Well, we can see a couple other brands on the far right. We've got, you know, Volvo, Ram, Dodge, uh, uh, and Buick, uh, all with substantially higher days of supply. Um, it is something that we got to keep an eye on for is to, we're at this point where we know the market's lean and mean. We know that the, the manufacturers want to stay lean and mean. The question is, is, you know, it's a game of chicken. You know, who's going to uh, let their inventories build and not start discounting uh, or try other avenues to, to try and keep to stay that in lean and mean? Um, that's what we're going to be watching for to see whether we can kind of see who uh, is going to start making a substantial change in their strategy. We also see the transaction prices continue to rise out there. We just got August uh, sales results and the average transaction price in August was $48,301. That was 11% higher than what it was uh, a year ago in August of 2021. So the, the rate of growth on prices is still quite high for the new vehicle market, but we are expecting the pace to slow as we get to the 
the, the further on in the year, but it's going to take a little bit of a time uh, for the that rate of growth to come down because the industry is still focused on making the most expensive and more EV uh, type products. Uh, and that's been what's con con contributing to driving these prices higher. So we'll talk about inflation when it gets to the used vehicle market, but it's, it's still going on here uh, in the new vehicle market. And all of it is still creating this seller's market. We expect the seller's market to continue through 2022 and into 2023, where there is not going to be a lot of discounting uh, and there's uh, uh, not going to be a lot of you know, available inventory that the dealers are going to be forced to, to negotiate with you. Uh, we can see here on the on the left, this is our measures of what we're tracking in terms of where incentive spending is at right now. And in dark blue, you can see that's the incentive percent of transaction price. And back in 2019, prior to COVID, it ran about 10, 11 percent uh, incentives as a percent of the transaction price. But it's been falling dramatically uh, during this tight inventory environment. And now we stand at just over 2 percent. We're kind of starting to flatline here, but you can see it just remains a very, very uh, lean environment in terms of discounting out there. We also are able to measure what is the price relative to the MSRP. And normally prior to COVID, this was running about 94, 95% uh, would be the price relative to the MSRP. There would be some discounting involved. But once we went uh, to the, this very lean environment, uh, you can see that that shot up to about 102% is the price uh, relative to the MSRP. Essentially, the MSRP is the price right now. And this is the environment that the manufacturers have wanted for a long time. And the question is, is can they maintain that? And that's what we're going to try and be monitoring that. A couple of the, the tools they can do that, I'll talk about in just a moment, uh, is to you know cut prices, uh, do more discounting, and also leverage other channels. But at this point, uh, revenues are still holding up fairly strong, that they're really not under the gun, that they have to do anything uh, substantially dramatic in the aggregate, right? Each manufacturer is going to have their own situation. But as we can see on the right, this is looking at where revenues stand today. Uh, so far, as I mentioned, year-to-date sales are down about 15%. But because of these high prices and these strong margins, we estimate, and this is just a back-of-the-envelope uh, price times uh, a number of sales calculation, we estimate that revenues are down just 4%. So these higher prices are really mitigating a lot of the uh, losses in volume. And this is something that's been going on for quite some time. And as we can see, I've summarized in calendar year 2021, uh, total revenue was about $650 billion for the industry, about $3 billion higher than it was in 2019, and yet we sold almost 2 million fewer vehicles last year, uh, but yet made more money. So that's kind of the situation we're in, this lean and mean environment, uh, and I, the industry is going to want to try and keep it going. And how are they going to do that? Well, one is incentives. You know, can they stay lean on the incentives? And this is a chart, and I'm kind of playing around with a few things. And I welcome any comments you guys have if you have any other ideas. Uh, but I'm trying to capture, you know, well, how are incentives changing? What are we seeing out there? So I looked at what are the what was the incentive uh, percent of transaction price for these different brands back in January of this year? And then what was it in April, July, and August? And just see if we can identify any kind of trends through the course of this year. Uh, and you can see that clearly everybody uh, has lowered their incentives uh, well, for the most part, almost everybody, from where it was in January. Uh, the one exception is you can see that Ram Trucks has actually uh, actually increased their incentives a little bit. Oh, excuse me. And so that's uh, you know something we saw, that they do have quite a bit of inventory, so that's not surprising. But for some of the other brands, you can see that almost everybody remains relatively low compared to where they were in January. But compared to where they were in July, we are starting to see a couple upticks. Uh, Jeep and Ford were ticking a little bit higher. Uh, we can see that also uh, Mercedes, just a hair, maybe ticking up a little bit higher, as well as Nissan. So this is a metric to watch here going forward is uh, as the inventories rebuild, as these interest rates go higher, do we start to see these bars start to go higher as well? Is more discounting going to be necessary for these different manufacturers in order to keep their sales going and also to keep uh, market share? The other thing we're going to be watching closely is the different sales channels. Uh, we know that the industry has changed dramatically in terms of the share of the market that these channels have been taking uh, in the post-COVID market. Uh, in the lease market here on the left, you can see that lease share has fallen dramatically. It's down to about you know, 16, 17 percent uh, year to date. We have a little bit of a delay on this data. I only have through June. Uh, but you can see it's fallen dramatically, almost half of what it was uh, just in 2019. 
So the amount of leasing that's going out there is down substantially. That's something that the industry can turn on rather quickly if they want to really rejuvenate sales and need to make some quick sales. They can always get heavy uh, uh, subvention on lease offers, uh, but they haven't done it yet. They really pulled back. So that's something we're going to be watching to see whether they do that. The other uh, channel that they could start to, to leverage would be fleet activity. And that's what I have on the right. And we can see that fleet sales fell dramatically uh, during the COVID crisis and still remains well below sort of industry norms. Uh, currently, year to date, we're looking at about fleet share of about 14%. A lot of the rental uh, car industry has been buying in the used market because they've been having a difficult time getting new uh, supply. So um, these are two channels that we could change quickly if the industry decides that there's too much inventory building on dealer lots and they want to start uh, rejuvenating uh, sales. The other thing just to keep in mind is that the fact that the industry has pulled back so heavily on these two channels means that the future supply of used vehicles is going to be under threat. So any concerns that we have about prices maybe coming coming down, just keep in mind that we already know that uh, the number of off-lease vehicles and fleet vehicles that could be coming to the used market is going to be substantially lower here uh, in coming years. So the other thing, I just want to give you an update of what we're hearing from dealers out there. We do the dealer sentiment index each quarter. You guys probably get surveyed at some point. And we asked uh, a number of questions, but I pulled out just a couple I thought were interesting. Is uh, how would you describe the current market for vehicles in the area where you operate? And in the second quarter, we can see on the far right that franchise dealers actually had an uptick. They say that uh, essentially the sentiment out there is, is holding its own or actually doing a little bit better. But you can see that independent dealers has fallen and, and that takes down the overall average uh, is a tick down. We're still above 50, uh, which is sort of our optimistic, pessimistic threshold. But you can clearly see that the trend is starting to head lower in terms of what is the dealer sentiment uh, out there. And then we ask, what do you expect from the market for vehicles in your area three months from now? Uh, and you can see on the far right that franchise dealers are a little bit more pessimistic. They're still optimistic in general, but less so from where they were just in the first quarter. But you can see that fran excuse me, independent dealers are, are quite a bit more uh, pessimistic. And all of this is taking down uh, the national average. So the mood out there is getting a little bit more worrisome about what the outlook is for the industry. But in terms of profits, they still appear to be holding up quite well. Uh, we ask uh, really two questions. The so question eight, how would you describe the current new vehicle inventory levels? Uh, well, that's what we've got uh, uh, down there. And you can see that in blue, you know, everybody's well aware that inventory levels are weak. They're a little bit better from where they were a few months back, but it's still a pretty weak situation. But we also ask, how would you describe your profits over the last three months? And you can see in green, the profits are holding up quite nicely. So the, the mood out there is starting to sour a little bit, but I think that's more an expectation than what people are actually realizing uh, in terms of their own business at this point. We also asked some questions about what factors are holding back your business and a couple of interesting things uh, pop out. Uh, you can see that the economy, 46% of uh, respondents uh, said that that's something that is starting to impact their business and that's a significant increase from what we had the previous quarter. And we can also see expenses, the political climate, consumer confidence, things that we've talked about are all uh, significantly higher. And we can see that business impact from the coronavirus is now starting to decline. So thankfully, uh, that's one uh, issue that's starting to, to be in our rear view mirror. Uh, but clearly, uh, the rising interest rates as well as uh, concerns about the economy are starting to weigh uh, on what dealers are thinking out there. So let's give a quick update of what's happening with the used vehicle market. And the situation there, too, has not changed very much, at least in terms of supply uh, and demand. Right now, I'm showing you on the left, this is available supply. Uh, and you can see we're running around 2.5 million used vehicles out there. We're running about 9% higher than what we had this week last year. So there is quite a few vehicles out there. But because we have uh, these higher price points, and a little bit less demand out there. Nobody, we don't have all the uh, consumers running around with their $1,400 stimulus checks like we had uh, in the spring of last year. Uh, it's a little bit tougher market to sell in. And as a result, we can see days of supply uh, is actually a little bit higher. So that inventory is gonna last a little bit longer uh, than it would last year because of the, uh, uh, the, the slowing sales pace. But clearly we can see this is not an inventory constrained market, but it may not have the right inventory in terms of what folks want to buy. They would probably like to buy less expensive vehicles, but that's not what we've got for them. 
But overall, this is looking at used uh, retail sales. And we can see that the market has been uh, declining as it normally does here in the spring period after we have the, the hot spring and the summer kind of drifts down a little bit. But recent data points are showing a little bit of strength in the used market. Uh, you can see it's kind of ticking up a little bit. Uh, the question is whether this has legs. Do we see that more folks have been forced into the used market that would normally be buying used this time of year? So maybe that's going to uh, lift used a little bit more than sort of a normal uh, declining pattern that we would see. Uh, that's something we got to keep an eye on. But clearly, uh, uh, the used market is holding its own, but not nearly at the level uh, that we had uh, the last couple of years. And one of the reasons is, is the used vehicle price. I've got a couple slides on price because I think it's quite interesting. This is showing the used vehicle price, just like I showed you a little bit earlier on the new vehicle. This is what we're seeing out there in the used market. And I think it's very interesting. We can see in gray there, that was 2019. Normally, the average used price was around 29, excuse me, $19,000. There was a little bit of a, about a 1% or 1.5% 1 inflation to that. So it kind of creeped higher through the course of the year. But you can see in light blue in 2020, uh, uh, when we saw that inventory levels started to get thin on the, on the used vehicle side, prices started to rise. And then when the supply crunch hit us last year in the new vehicle market, in dark blue, you can see that used prices really took off. And that's where we are today. So far this year in red, you can see that used vehicle prices are essentially flatlined again. We've already had our, our big shift to a new level. Uh, we now see that prices are going to start to return to more normal pricing patterns. So we don't expect to see uh, this rate of growth continue. And in fact, the rate of growth has been gradually declining uh, over the course of the summer. By the time we get to year's end, it's very possible that that red line may even be a little bit below the dark blue line. On a year-over-year -year basis, we may find that some of the prices have to give back a little bit because we had such a massive increase uh, last year. That's one of the things we'll be keeping an eye on. But we can see on the left here, this is just the average price over the last two years, how quickly it's risen and how it's flatlined. And on the right, this is showing the year over year change in that line. This is where uh, when the Federal Reserve Chairman was talking about a lot of the inflation was cyclical out there. Well, this is a perfect example of that. Once we get past the year over the year anniversary of when prices really started to shift higher, you can see that the rate of growth starts to come down. And so now we've fallen dramatically from about 28% year-over-year price increases just a few months ago to now we're below 10%. And they're likely to continue to fall further. And we're also seeing that prices uh, at auction uh, are starting to decline. The Mannheim Index has been falling, I think, for seven of the last uh, eight months. It's been ticking lower, but it was at a normally high peak. So it's really not surprising to see it pull back a little bit. What this chart is showing is this is showing the normal depreciation of about a three-year-old vehicle uh, at, at, uh, uh, at auction. Uh, it essentially, and through the course of the year. So it starts the year at 100% of its value. And then by week 52, it falls to generally about 90% of, of its value. It loses about 10% or so uh, of its, re of its uh, value over the course of the year. What you can see last year in that, uh, that 2021 at the very top, we just violated all of our normal pricing rules. That the vehicles were appreciating at auction; they were taking, you know, just going up much higher. Really, just crazy stuff was going on at auction. What we can see in dark red, uh, excuse me, the red that I've highlighted here, is that we're kind of returning to more normal pricing patterns. Yes, uh, prices are starting to depreciate a little bit more than they normally do, uh, but um, it more or less kind of falls more into normal pricing patterns. And that's again what we're expecting that. As the dust settles here, as we see the uh, inventory situation improve, we're going to start to see all of these pricing uh, metrics return to more normal patterns. So lastly, I just want to finish up talking about EV adoption, because this has been a, a hot topic, I'm sure, for everybody. Uh, and uh, it's only going to get hotter, I can say, through the course of this year. This is a chart that's showing uh, uh, all alternatives, so it's including EVs and hybrids, and then I've actually actually pulled out just EVs only, just so you can see them. But what we can see is that hybrid EV share has really just been taking off. Uh, last year, it was about 9.8% of the market. So far, year to date, this year, it's 12.4% of the market. So it's really been rising rapidly. And it's not just Tesla, it's alternatives as well. Uh, uh, alternatives in general, hybrids, even traditional hybrids like a Prius or plug-in hybrids, they've been selling quite well in this environment. And part of it is the manufacturers have been making those vehicles. They have a higher price point. 
Uh, they know that the, the consumers for them are generally higher incomes, so they've been getting some favorite uh, treatment from the manufacturers themselves. But all of that has been leading to a rising share of alternative vehicles. And that's likely to continue once we get this Inflation Reduction Act, uh, all the implications of it to hit the market. Uh, President Biden signed this into effect just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and although it's called the Inflation Reduction Act, it actually had a huge portion that was focused solely on the EV market uh, and is really trying to change uh, the future of how EVs are manufactured, where batteries are manufactured, uh, and is trying to stimulate demand from consumers. It's a very complicated bill. I could probably spend a whole hour just talking about that, and I'm no expert on it. But I did pull out a few things that I think are worthwhile for, for folks to know. Um, the, key, the key takeaways here to qualify for this, it has to be a vehicle assembled in North America. So imported EVs are not going to qualify for this. Um, they also eliminated the tax credit cap. Uh, so GM and Toyota and Tesla, which had hit that cap, uh, that's going to be removed come January 1st. So they're going to be able to start qualifying for any of these credits again. The tax credit that's going to go into effect is $7,500 potentially. You get $3,550 from uh, if the battery is used, uh, made using critical uh, components that qualify. Uh, and you also can get $3,550 for the battery itself if, where it's manufactured. And again, it gets quite complicated, but the minerals have to come from countries that are in a free trade agreement with the U.S. Uh, you need about 40% of so of those minerals to come from those countries, and that percentage is going to go higher. And as well as the assembly, uh, you know, 40% in the U.S. now, it's going to be rising such that everything's got to be made in the U.S., uh, and all of the, the materials have to come from uh, friendly countries, essentially. So it's going to get quite complicated, but it's going to be something the manufacturers are really going to have to pay attention to to make sure that their vehicles qualify for this. There's also a uh, price uh, cap on it. Uh, SUVs and pickups and vans that are priced above $80,000 will not qualify. And only sedans and hatchbacks uh, under $55,000 are going to qualify. So that's going to leave out a lot of the, the lead, uh, you know, the leading vehicles out there. A lot of Tesla products are not going to qualify for this. <clears throat> and there's also buyer income caps. Um, for a new vehicle, uh, you can't be making more than $300,000 as a joint filer, uh, all the way down to $150,000 as a single filer. So uh, there are income caps with the uber wealthy are not going to be able to qualify for these credits. And something new in this bill is it's going to be available for used vehicles. And this, again, is kind of tricky, but it's going to be something you dealers are going to want to be aware of, that there is going to be a $4,000 credit uh, available uh, for lower, well, there, it is income constrained. So if you have $150,000 or more as a joint filer, you won't qualify. It goes all the way down up to a $75,000 for a single filer. So uh, the, the used vehicle tax credit can be up to $4,000, um, but couple of things to know about it. One, you can't have already gotten the tax credit as a new vehicle. It's a one-time deal. So it has to be those vehicles that didn't get it on the new side that can qualify for it uh, on the used side. And um, it, you have to own the vehicle for two years. So you can't flip these vehicles. And it has to go to an end consumer. A dealer can't buy these vehicles and get these credits. So that's one of the things to be uh, aware of. And again, I'm no expert on this, but I do think in order to qualify for these credits, and to get them from the government, uh, the dealer has to be registered with the St Department of Transportation uh, for eligibility in order to be someone who can be approved to give out these credits. So uh, it's all coming. It's going to be co complicated. But I think the key takeaway is the immediate impact is not going to be too much. Uh, there's not a lot of folks that are buying these vehicles that have these lower uh, that would qualify because of these incomes. Uh, and there's not a lot of vehicles that are priced in this price range that are going to qualify. But that's all going to change as we go further and, and more and more vehicles uh, will qualify. So it is something uh, to be aware of. But all of this is going to be changing the assumptions on how we get to electrification. This is a chart I'm pulling from uh, IHS market. I guess they're now S&P Global. We buy their forecast in terms of what their long-term outlook is uh, by powertrain. And so I'm sharing with you, this is their latest forecast from June. And I think there's a couple of really interesting things in here. But couple of highlights. One, they see that EVs reach 43% share of the market by around 2030. But the other interesting thing there is look at the hybrids, uh, the full hybrids, the mile hybrids, the plug-in hybrids. They're really just a temporary solution. 
right? They, we, they're going to have growth here through the course of this decade, but then they're going to flatline and then they're going to pull back. And uh, there's really not going to be future growth in EVs. It's kind of a temporary plug while we make this transition away from uh, gas engines. And you can see on the far right, the outlook for gas engines is they're going to fall to just 10% of the market uh, by 2034, according to IHS. So uh, this is what the forecast has been in June. But as I said, we just passed this uh, Inflation Reduction Act, so I think things, the outlook may change substantially. And that's one of the things that we're seeing out there. I, I attend a number of conferences and read a lot of things, and I can tell you, everybody's, everybody's drinking the Kool-Aid now. Uh, this is a chart I found uh, on uh, Twitter. Uh, it was showing Boston Consulting Group's uh, changing forecast of when EVs hit 50% of, of, of the market. Uh, and you can see that in 2018, they only thought about uh, uh, by 2030, uh, EV share would only be about 21%, but you can see it's been rising rapidly over the last four years, and their most recent projection is now 53% by 20, uh, 2030. So the consensus thinking out there is that EVs are coming, and they're going to come much more rapidly, and certainly the president's uh, new bill of adding subsidies to electric vehicles is only going to help uh, us further adoption. So I think that's something to be aware of. And we're starting to see activity around the country. I, I'm a big naysayer on EVs. I just don't see them selling like hotcakes, but I think I've got to change my own thinking because uh, I am starting to see it in the data out there. This is a chart that's showing uh, from the registrations data what EV, mar EV and hybrid combined market share is uh, back in 2021 for each state in the union. And it's on a relative basis. So in, in the darkest blue, that would be California. They're at about 22% share of their vehicles are hybrids and electrics in 2021. And then in the, the reddest of red, they have the lowest share and that would be Louisiana, only about 3.5% of their sales in 2021 were EVs and hybrids. But you can see there's a lot of red around the country. Not a lot of folks are buying these electric and hybrids. Uh, they're clearly uh, appear to be more concentrated uh, on the West Coast and probably some big cities, um, but that's gonna start to change and we're already seeing it in the data. This is looking at year to date through the first half of this year, uh, what EV and hybrid registrations data had done in all the different states around the country. And nationally, they were up, just EVs and hybrids uh, uh, in the, just the first half, were up 17% uh, in H1. But you can see that across all the states, uh, you know, Alaska, Utah, Oklahoma, uh, some of the reddest of states are looking at uh, year over year changes in EV hybrid sales of 40%. So they're up substantially. And all the way down, you can see on the far left there, there's West Virginia. They actually saw EV and hybrid share, uh, actually, or excuse me, sales fall about 15%. But even that's better than the nation. The nation, all vehicles across the nation fell about 20% in the first half. So even the, the worst selling EV hybrids in, in West Virginia are doing better than the, nation, uh, the nation's average across all vehicles. So these EVs are selling out there, even in, in hardcore red states. And so I think we have to uh, accept that there is a, a much stronger outlook for EVs and they're going to be adopted uh, more quickly. And there actually was a big announcement today. Uh, Chevrolet announced the uh, electric Blazer is going to be coming out next year and is going to be have a price point of near $30,000. That's what they're saying. I don't know if I believe it could actually get to that price point. Uh, but that's what they're promoting right now. And that really would be a game changer to, to offer a big popular SUV like that uh, for at that price point. I think that's going to put a lot of competition out there, uh, a lot of uh, pressure on a lot of, uh, of their competition out there. But I just want to finish up by saying, that, you know, for all this talk of EVs, it is going to be a very long transition to get to an electrified vehicle fleet. Um, I pulled the data from uh, the IHS vehicle park or the, the vehicles that are on the road in the United States. And currently we have about 280 million vehicles on the road in the US and 99.5% of them use gasoline. So it is gonna take a very long time for electric vehicles, which uh, you know, sold a little over a million last, you know, the hybrids and electric sold a little over a million last year to, you know, to get to a level that they're even gonna to start to register in a sizable form uh, on this chart is gonna take some time. Um, and because of the changes that we've had over the last year, Consumers are going to hold on to these vehicles even longer than they were going to before. Right now, the average vehicle age is about 12 years, and that value of that vehicle has increased substantially. And just to give you an idea, uh, in 2019, at auction, 
a 12 year old vehicle at wholesale would go for about $3,900. In 2022, at auction, a 12 year old vehicle is going for about $6,700. So there's been a huge shift up. It's over a 70% increase in the, in the uh, realized value of that vehicle at auction. So that means that the, the, the 280 million vehicles out there have gone up in value by uh, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars. And that means it's gonna, consumers are going to want to keep that vehicle even longer than before. And the economics of replacing that engine, of fixing that transmission, just make that much more sense if I can get uh, you know, another year or two's use out of this vehicle. I think it does add a lot of pressure on car dealers. Uh, they're going to have to have capabilities of fixing the old, uh, uh, you know, carburetor engines, uh, along with being able to maintain the, the latest and greatest technologies out there. I think that's going to be a, a real struggle for a lot of fixed op departments to be able to do it all. Um, the other thing I just want to point out is I think there's going to be a real challenge in keeping uh, this vehicle fleet going because we've already seen the issues of, of having a shortage of chips on new vehicles. What's going to be the supply of repair chips uh, for these vehicles as we go through time here? Another 20 years is that a rear window chip, uh, you know, going to be available to fix a 2020, you know, uh, Mazda or Subaru? I don't know uh, what what the replacement capabilities are going to be, given uh, how difficult it is today just to get new vehicle chips. So I think there is uh, some longer term concerns. The other one too is is that if the government does try to make this transition much more quickly and implement any kind of scrappage programs or something to try and get people to get rid of those older vehicles uh, as quickly as possible and force people to buy a uh, much more fuel efficient electric vehicles. It's going to take massive uh, intervention from the government to, to do that. And it's going to target uh, the, old, the old legacy Detroit three uh, companies much more than other uh, manufacturers. You can see there on the on the far left, the 20 years column, that big chunk of dark blue, that's American brands. They're, they're over you know, 25 million of those vehicles are 20 years old. If you're trying to make uh, those vehicles go to the scrapyard, that, that may be a difficult uh, political issue that, that has to be wrestled with. But that said, the outlook is gonna take a long time for these, for these uh, electric vehicles to take over the marketplace, but make no mistake, they are coming and we better uh, all be prepared for it. So just that's the end of my comments. Just if you guys have any questions or have, uh, uh, further interest in what Cox Automotive is doing. We do have a number of uh, sites online that we do post a lot of our uh, our content as well as uh, analysis. And I suggest uh, going there if you want to get the latest and greatest here, if they don't want to just wait uh, every quarter for, for my updates. So those are my comments that I've got for this time around. I welcome any uh, questions or concerns that you guys might have. Please feel free to, to send me a note. Charlie, thanks so much for joining us again. It'll be interesting to see how things look when we have you back on in December. Hopefully the consumer sentiment index kind of trends more positively than right now. Um, again, you will all be receiving a copy of this webinar by early next week. To those on the line, meet me back here this Tuesday, September 13th at 2 p.m. Eastern as Aaron Kerrigan of Kerrigan Advisors answers the question, are blue sky values peaking? For more information about AIADA, visit AIADA.org. Thanks for tuning in and have a great day, everyone.